I wanted to do this video because over the years at work, a lot of people have asked me for help on various software problems that they've had, such as Word, Outlook, and Excel. So this video includes tips on those programs as well as general work efficiency tips that I've come up with over the years to help save myself a lot of time. If you're only interested in hearing what I have to say about a certain program, feel free to look down in the description below to see at which time marker I discussed that program so you can jump straight to that. I created a PowerPoint that goes through the various areas that I'm going to cover. I want to start off with basic work efficiency tips and number one is spend time learning how to type fast without looking at the keyboard. Over the course of your life, this will save you so much time if you're one of those people who needs to look at the keyboard to figure out which letter you're typing. I can type about 60 to 70 words a minute because I took a class back in high school. I'm sure there are plenty of websites that can help you increase your speed. Next is use templates if you frequently work on a document that only has a small number of changes each time. Just save the original document with a different file name. In addition to using that for documents, you can also use it for emails. For instance, I have to send a quarterly email to some people, so I go back to my sent folder and I just click reply to all and I just update the subject, and in the body of the email, I just change whatever information needs to be updated. This way you have all of the email addresses already in the to field. My next tip is to stay on top of your emails. I read all of my emails when I wake up in the morning on my phone. I read them as they come in when I'm at work, and I don't leave the office or go to bed without reading all of my emails, so I rarely have any unopened emails in my inbox. A former coworker of mine showed me his cell phone and he had over 36,000 unopened emails. I don't know what homeboy was up to. Time to unsubscribe from that recipe of the day mailing list. If you have to read a long document or book, I find it helpful to write cliff notes as I go along with the most important points. That way when I'm finished, I can just read a summary of the most important points to refresh my memory. If you need help, ask the program for it. A lot of people don't seem to know that there's a help feature in pretty much every piece of software. Just go to the menu bar of any software program and it should be up there towards the right. And if you can't find the answer in help, just go to Google or YouTube to search it. Create folders with subfolders and more subfolders. In Outlook, as well as on your hard drive, it helps to create folders with other subfolders. If you have 10,000 emails in your inbox and no folders, you're really out of control. So <laughs> at work, I usually come up with several folders for my email and my hard drive, and then I come up with subfolders for those. So the main folders I usually use are accounting, calls, documents, finance, human resources, IT, legal, meetings, office, sales and marketing, save, and travel. So I have a bunch of subfolders under each of these. For instance, in accounting, I have subfolders for check requests, expenses, invoices. It saves so much time to know exactly where to look for an email or an old file. When I start a new job, I've found that it's very helpful to create a Word document with notes on how to perform all of my tasks. I highly suggest creating one of these when you start a new job, or if you don't have one now, I suggest that you create one. My notes documents at my last three jobs, each of them were over 100 pages long. I include frequently used information such as links and logins to websites, as well as information that I rarely use, the process on how to do certain work tasks, software tips such as the one I'm sharing right now. I put general topic headings throughout the document and bold, underline, and center them for easier searching. Some headings that I use are accounting. Within this, I also do headings that are underlined and centered for expense reports, invoices, check requests, calls, documents human resources, IT, people, sales and marketing, software, tips for various software, travel with subheadings for hotels, airlines, etc., and various. What makes this document so valuable to me to save time is the Control plus F feature, which allows you to find any keyword in a document. If I have a 130-page Word document and I'm trying to find the section where I have information about the tax ID of one of my company's subsidiaries, I could spend a minute searching through all of my files trying to figure out where it is, but since I know that I have it saved in my notes document, all I have to do is click Control F, type in the keyword, and it'll take me to it in about two seconds. So I'm in my notes document, I'm going to push down and hold the Control key and then push F. It opens up the Find and Replace window. So in find what, I'm going to enter the keyword I want to jump to. So I'm going to enter tax ID, click enter, and it jumps to page 25, which has the tax ID. So I just did that in about two to three seconds. In addition to control F for find, there are other helpful combos, such as control Z undoes the last action, 
X will cut whatever you select, C will copy it, V will paste it, whatever you cut or copied, Control plus A will select all of the text or data in a document, B, U, and I are bold, underline, and italic, Control plus backspace will delete a full word, Hold Control down while using left or right arrow keys will move the cursor one word at a time. Press Home or End on the keyboard to go to the beginning or end of a line. Hold Control and press Home or End to go to the beginning or end of a document. So I'm going to highlight a section. So I, when I do Control X, it'll cut it. When I do Control Z, it undoes the last action and it puts it back in there. So if I do Control C, it copies it. So I'm going to go down here and do Control V and it just pasted whatever I copied. If I do Control A, it selects all of the data. Normally when you push the backspace key, it'll delete one character at a time, but I'm going to do Control Z to undo that. But if you hold Control and hold backspace, it deletes one word at a time. Normally when you push the right or left arrow key, it'll go one character at a time. But if you hold the control key while pushing left, it'll go to the first letter of each word. And the same thing if you go to the right while holding control, it goes to the first letter of each word. If you press the home key on your keyboard, it goes to the beginning of any line. If you push the end key, it goes to the end of any line. If you push down the control key and push home, it goes to the top of a document. If you push end while holding control, it goes to the end of a document. You can use your mouse for a few different options, such as if you left click to the left of any line, it selects that entire line. Or you can hold down left click and drag down and it selects multiple lines. So here I'm also going to right click on top of the selected text and it gives you a bunch of different options such as cut, copy, paste. If you do something such as font, it opens up a window where you can do more options like here's the strike through, to put a line through it. I suggest that you look at all of these options on your own time, not on my time. <laughs> so if I select all of this, I right click, cut, I can come down here and click paste and that does that really quickly. Similar to control plus find, you can replace a word or a character throughout a document to save a lot of time. There's two ways to replace. So you can either go on the home tab and come over here to the editing tab and click replace, or you can do the control F and you'll see it has tabs for find, replace, or go to. So you're going to go to the replace option. And in this example, I have airport codes that are all separated by a semicolon and three spaces. And my objective is to get them all in one straight line without the semicolons. So what do I want to find? I want to find a semicolon with three spaces. And I want to replace it with a paragraph mark. So I have to click more to get more options here and replace. I want to find a special character, which is the paragraph mark. So you see that just entered there. So now I want to click replace all. And it said it replaced 16 instances of the semicolon in three spaces. I just want to click close. And as you see, that was a lot quicker than having to go through each one and delete that. There are a bunch of different combinations that you can use to replace. For instance, say you created a document that talks about the sun and you have 942 references to the word sun in it and you only use lowercase s's in the document but you realized you needed to use an uppercase s. All you would have to do is go to replace and you do sun and replace with s-u-n and do replace all and it would replace every single instance in that entire document with the uppercase sun. The next thing I'm going to show is how to copy whatever you see on your monitor. And there's two ways to do this, either the screenshot key or the snipping tool. So I'm going to show you an extra tip. Say that you like to search the internet for funny cat pictures. Most people go to Google and then they search, but there's something up here called images, which will only search for photos, not just websites. So type in funny cat pictures. And these are the results. So there's a key on your keyboard that says print screen. Usually it's abbreviated for PRT space SC or PRT space SCR. Sometimes you might also have to push the function key before you push print screen to enable it. So on my current laptop, I have to hold down the FN, which is function key, and then I push print screen. So it just copied whatever is on the screen and pasted it onto the clipboard. So you can go to any other program and paste it in. I'm going to open the paint program and I just click paste and it pastes the entire screen image. Most photo programs have an editing feature called crop. 
which allows you to select only a portion of the image. So I'm going to hold down the left click and drag down to the right and I let go and I come up here and I click crop and it selects only the area that I chose. I've been using print screen for a really long time and I recently found out about another program on Windows called snipping tool and I can right click and select pin to taskbar and it shows up here as an icon. So in the future, whenever I need to use the snipping tool, all I have to do is push this with one left click and it opens. So here's the snipping tool. You can see here it says new and there's a down arrow which allows for four different types of snips. Free form, rectangular, window snip, or full screen. So for rectangular snip, I'm going to do basically what I just did here. Hold down the left click and drag to the bottom right. And you'll see as soon as I let go of the left click, it created a new window with just the selection. So I can either click here, which is the save option. And you'll, if you go to save as type, you can see it's PNG, GIF, don't say GIF, you sound like a peanut butter obsessed clown, JPEG, or whatever the hell this other thing is. <laughs> most people do JPEG, and by most people I mean me, so you should be like me. In addition to opening up in that small window, it also automatically copied it to your clipboard, so you can paste it in email, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, any other document. I've noticed that some people might have seven or eight different windows and programs open on their computer. And when they have to get back to the desktop, they go through each program and minimize it. There's two helpful ways to get back to the desktop. One way is if you look on your PC keyboard in the bottom left, there should be a key with the Windows icon on it. So you hold that down and you push the letter D and it goes straight to your desktop. Yes, I did that desktop picture just to be funny because my real desktop picture shouldn't be on YouTube. Anyway, the second way to get back to the desktop is if you come in this area down here on this bar and you right click it says show the desktop and you left click that and it goes straight back to the desktop. The next tip of have the printer work for you is mostly for people who work in offices who have an expensive printer. A lot of people print out a 12 page document and then they try to use the stapler in the supply room or whatever and they can't get the staple to be straight. Sometimes it won't go through all the way. But a lot of people don't seem to know that in your printer properties, there are options for the printer to staple for you. It can staple in the top left. You can do two staples at the top. You can do it in the top right. You can do top left slanted. You can have it do three hole punch for you. But it depends on how expensive the printer is at your work. Because I imagine most people don't have the capability to do this on home printers. It depends on the driver software that you have for your printer. I would suggest that if you can't figure it out on your own by going in printer properties, ask your IT help desk. It'll definitely save you a lot of time and frustration trying to get the staple to be perfect. <coughs> Next up is save time typing email and document subjects. Say I have a Word document that has a long file name and I need to email it to somebody. So I go file, send, and it's gonna open up in a new email in Outlook with the file name already entered in the subject. So usually I just delete the file extension, and that saved me time from having to type in the subject. For those of you who use Adobe to send files, they no longer automatically put the file name in the subject. So another quick tip is to do file, save as. If you left click once in the file name, it will highlight the entire file name. So on my keyboard, what I do is control plus C to copy, and then I go to the email subject, and I just do control V to paste it. And like I said, I just delete the file extension. I work with a lot of files that have similar file names. So to save time, I do file save as when creating a new file. And I just browse to whatever folder has the similar file names. And I'll left click a different file. And as you see, it changed the file name to be that. And I'm just going to update it to just say like file 2. And that way I didn't have to type out the entire thing again. Next up is using Windows Explorer to save time. To get to Windows Explorer, you can either push this icon of a folder down here, or you can go to your start button and go to computer. One way that I use this to save time is at work when I have to go to a shared drive and find a certain folder, which sometimes can take like six or seven clicks. So for my most used folders, I drag them to the favorites bar. So I'm going to show you how I do that. So pretend like I had to go to six or seven different clicks to get to this folder and 
say this document folder is something that I use maybe 10 times a day, and I don't want to click six or seven times every time I need to get here. So I left click this once and I left click and drag on top of favorites. And every time I come here, this is going to show here. So instead of doing all those clicks, all I have to do is left click it once and it shows all the files in that folder. A way to save time on opening a document that you've already created is to use recent files. So in Word, if I click up here, you'll see that there are three documents listed that are the most recent documents that I've worked on. Instead of having to click through a bunch of directories to get back to this document, all you have to do is click on it and it opens it up. I usually keep a list of 20 recent documents open and to do that you go to Word Options, Advanced, and you scroll down to display and here it says show this number of recent documents you can I don't even know how many you can go up to but go for the world record <laughs> there's a program called notepad that I find helpful when I need to remove any kind of formatting from some text to get to notepad just search start, type in note come up here notepad is a basic text editor that allows you to view or edit text files when you paste any kind of text into notepad it removes all the formatting which is good when you copy from websites to remove html formatting i also use it whenever i run into a problem in word or excel where i can't format a certain part of it i've resolved problems before where i cut it out of excel and i pasted it into notepad and then i pasted it back into excel and it solved the problem so as an example i have this news story of a two-headed porpoise that's going to break your heart. So I'm just going to... Oh, <gasps> so I'm going to left click and drag down to copy part of this article. And as you see, it's copying the pictures, the text, the ads, the two-headed porpoises. <laughs> so I'm going to right click, copy, and I come to notepad and I click paste and you have the basic text that you can send to somebody without all the formatting. There's also a way in Word to paste it unformatted. You go to paste, paste special, and here you'll see you can do unformatted text, HTML, unformatted Unicode. So if you do unformatted text, it shows it without the photos and all the HTML tags. In this section, I'm going to talk about Outlook and I'm going to talk about email format, folders, subfolders and rules reducing emails, scheduling group meetings and calls, and calendar items. Sometimes I'll receive an email in Outlook and I'll try to insert a picture and it'll say that I'm not allowed to because pictures will be lost because it's in plain text or rich text format. Down here it gives you the option to switch to HTML. So you select that and it allows you to paste pictures of monkeys into emails. <laughs> Another time when it's useful to know this option is when you are trying to format any kind of text. So I just selected this and you'll see that the bold, italics, and underline are all grayed out because it's in plain text. So you have to go to Options, HTML, and then when you go back here, you'll be able to edit the text. This is my home outlook, but my goal is to have as few emails as possible in my inbox. I only keep emails in my inbox that have a to-do item on them. So if I'm done with an email, I move it to one of my subfolders. In my inbox, I have 10 main folders that I have. So I have accounting and finance, calls, documents, human resources, IT, legal, meetings, sales and marketing, save, and travel. This McAfee thing is something I can't delete. I have almost 600 folders and subfolders in my inbox at work. If you hardly have any Outlook folders and you have about 10,000 or more emails in your main inbox, you really should probably try to fix that. <laughs> and within each of these main folders, I have a bunch of subfolders. So under accounting and finance, I have a folder for invoices, I have another folder for expenses, another one for check requests. Under travel, I have a folder for every year. And so within each year, I have different folders for various trips. If you have a lot of emails in your inbox now and you hardly have any subfolders, I suggest that you create some subfolders and you can create a rule to move some of the existing emails in your inbox to these new subfolders. So to create a rule, go to Tools, Rules, and Alerts. You're going to select New Rule. And you can go through this rules wizard to identify exactly which emails you want to move and which folder you want to move them to. So say we want to move messages with specific words in the subject to a folder. So I'm going to come down to step two and select specific words. So say I get a weekly email from United Airlines on all the passengers they abused this past week. So in the subject, I'm going to enter United Airlines and I'm going to click add. Okay. 
and move it to the specified folder. So I want it to come down to the United Airlines subfolder under travel. So I click OK. I'm going to click the next option. So the next screen says, which conditions do you want to check? So you can select more filters in case you want to be more specific. I click next. It says, what do you want to do with the messages? So you have more options here that you can click. I'll click next again. Are there any exceptions? So you can read through these and put a check mark next to anything that you want. Click next. And here you should click run this rule now on messages already in my inbox. And you also want to check turn on this rule. And when you click finish, it'll search through your entire inbox for any subject that has United Airlines in it and move it to that subfolder that says United Airlines. And in the future, as you receive more emails that have the subject United Airlines in it, such as United Airlines goes bankrupt from beating passengers, it'll automatically go to that subfolder. I personally don't have any of these automatic rules because I'm able to keep on top of my emails. But if you receive a lot of emails and a lot of them are from newsletters or certain things that you hardly ever read, I suggest creating a new subfolder for those type of emails and creating a new rule where all of those new emails will automatically be sent to the subfolder. To keep the number of emails in my inbox small, I only keep the most recent email in a string of emails. So for example, say a certain email subject might end up having 18 different replies to the initial email. As I receive each newest reply, I delete the last email unless there was an attachment that I also need to keep. To do this in your current inbox, I suggest that you sort all of your emails by subject and delete any that are repetitive. So if you are going back and forth on an email thread with one person or more, and the most recent email has everybody's replies within it, you can delete all of the older emails unless they have an attachment. I have Outlook 2007, which does not have the scheduling assistant, so I had to do a screenshot of somebody else's Outlook 2010. But when you're trying to schedule a group call at work and you want to find out what the best time is, I suggest using the scheduling assistant. As you can see here, somebody entered all of the attendees in the appointment, and then they click the Scheduling Assistant tab. And for everybody who is on the same network as that person, they're able to see which times are blocked out on their calendar. As you can see here, 11 a.m., 1 p.m., 4 p.m., and 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. the next day are open on people's calendars. So when you send an email to schedule this call with all of these people, at least you have an idea of what times to propose. Next up is how to make a calendar item private. So say you're at work and you remember that your back is getting kind of hairy. Oh my God. <laughs> And so you put on your calendar, shave back hair, but you don't want your assistant or your coworkers to see that you need to shave your hairy back. So up here, if you click private, it'll show on their calendars that you have that time blocked off, but it won't show any of the details of all the nasty stuff you're going to be doing tonight at seven o'clock. One other quick tip is in your email signature, I suggest that you add thank you so that you don't have to type that every single time. It'll automatically be in your email signature. I wanna talk a little bit about calendar reminders and tasks. I use so many calendar reminders as opposed to tasks, just so I can see them on my calendar for what I need to do for the day, even though I snooze on a lot of stuff. I use a lot of recurring reminders just to make sure I get certain tasks done every day. So let's say at every day at four o'clock, I want to approve expenses. So I'm gonna come up here to recurrence. I'm gonna click daily and I'm gonna click every weekday since I don't want it reminding me every Saturday and Sunday. Down here, you can do the start of the occurrence or you can click an end by date or just choose no end date just to keep it going forever. One tip I have for recurring reminders or all day events, say you're going on vacation and you wanna let other people know. So you click all day event, I'm gonna be on vacation the entire week. And you see up here, it has the reminder set to 18 hours. Well, 18 hours before 12 a.m. is 6 a.m. One other tip I have about recurring reminders and all day events is when you click all day event, you can see the reminder time changes. Just make sure that this time is not something crazy. I mean, I've had people send me calendar invites about their vacation and the reminder has gone off on my phone at 11.45 p.m. and woken me up. So you don't really want to wake up your coworkers at quarter to midnight letting them know that you're in the Bahamas when they have to wake up in the morning. Another suggestion I have is when you set up a meeting or a call, let people know in the subject exactly what it is. Some people send calendar invites with a subject like management update, but I try to add either meeting or a call at the beginning of a subject so people know if it's going to be a meeting or a call. In this section, I'm going to talk about Excel. I'm going to talk about Alt plus Enter, how to insert a new line within a cell, how to get to the top and bottom of a worksheet quickly, selecting all of the data, adding borders, freezing panes, merging cells, wrapping text, 
and resizing cells. I downloaded a random spreadsheet from Microsoft. So first up, people seem to have a problem figuring out how to add a new line within a cell. So people automatically think, oh, if I click enter, it'll add a new line. What you have to do is put your cursor in the cell and then hold down the alt key on your keyboard and push enter. And you can enter new text below that and it's within the same cell. If you want to jump to the top of your spreadsheet, hold down the control key on your keyboard and push home and it goes to cell A1. If you hold down control and push end, it goes to the last cell in your sheet. If you want to select all the data in a sheet, hold down control and push the A key. I find it easier to read a spreadsheet when there's a border. So under the home tab for font, you can see this icon here that has borders. So I prefer to choose all borders. And as you can see, it added darker lines around here, which I think is more helpful to read. If you want to select all of the cells in the spreadsheet, all you have to do is click this corner cell up here and left click it once. To remove the borders, just go up here and click no border. There are a bunch of different options for borders. You can select top border. So you can see it goes on the top of that cell and you can just do Mexico, USA, and we're on top and they're on the bottom and Trump is happy. A helpful feature in Excel when you have a lot of data and you want to keep a certain row or column constant throughout as you're scrolling is called freeze pane. So if you see up in the view tab under the window tab, you see there are three options for freeze panes, freeze top row, or freeze first column. So say I want rows five and six to remain constant as I scroll throughout. Right now it doesn't work. So I'm going to select row seven by clicking once on seven come up to freeze panes, select the top option, and as you see, as I scroll down now, it keeps rows five and six constant throughout. Also, if you want certain rows or columns to print on the top of every page, all you have to do is come to the page layout tab, and under page setup, you click the print titles icon, and under the page setup window, you go to the sheet tab, and it says rows to repeat at the top. So I'm gonna click this icon once, and if I click row one, it automatically selects that row. So I'm gonna click enter on my keyboard. And if I go to print preview, you'll see that row prints at the top of all three pages. So it's easier to read. If you wanna merge two or more cells, there's two different ways to do it. Up here, you can see I have this title and say I want to center it. So I'm gonna left click and hold the left cell and I'm gonna drag it as far as I want. So it goes to the column F. Up on the home tab, you can see under alignment, there's an option for merge and center. So I just click that once and it merges and centers all of these cells. The other way to do it is if you have cell one and cell two here, I'm gonna left click and drag to select them both. And then while my cursor is over one of the cells, I'm gonna right click it, go down to format cells. Under the alignment tab, you're gonna select merge cells and push okay. You're gonna get an error message, but you can just click okay. And you'll see it merged the two cells, although it deleted the data in cell two. Another problem that people run into in Excel is when data won't fit inside the cells. You'll see here that I have five columns and nine rows of text that isn't fitting. So what are the things that I can do to clean this up? One way is I'm gonna click up here in the corner to select all of the data. Next, I'm gonna double click any of the lines in between two columns. As you can see, it changed the column width to match whatever was the length of the text. Another option is to select all of the text and then right click and go down to format cells. Select wrap text and then click OK. As you can see, it's a little bit better showing all the text, but say you want to drag it out more. So I'm going to put my cursor over one of the lines in between the columns and I'm going to drag it to the right. Obviously that made it a little bit different. So what I want to do to clean it up is to come in between the line between two rows and double click. And as you see, it cleaned it up a little bit more. A few times I've run into a problem where I could not figure out how to format a cell correctly. So what I figured out was that I needed to cut the data out of the cell, paste it into Notepad to remove all of the formatting, and then I just cut and pasted it back into the Excel spreadsheet and it fixed the problem. Another problem I once ran into was I copied some numbers from a website and pasted it into Excel, but it had an extra space at the end that I could not get rid of. To solve this, I copied and pasted the entire column into Word and did a find and replace of the space and replace the space with nothing and then I pasted it back into Excel and it worked. A few times I've had to send somebody a long list of files that I have in a certain folder of mine so it's really time consuming to write out all the file names in maybe a folder that has a hundred files. So what you do is you go in Windows Explorer to the folder that has all the files that you need to copy the file names. So I'm going to left click once on the top file name and then I'm going to scroll down to the last file name and while holding shift on my keyboard, I'm going to select the left click again, which selects all of the files. So while still holding down the shift key, I'm going to right click over the documents. I'm going to come down to copy as path. 
I'm going to then paste it into Excel. And as you can see, it has the full file path. So I'm going to just double click in between here to extend the length of the column. And since I just want to show the actual file name, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the front part of this. I'm going to left click and drag to the left. On my keyboard, I'm going to do Control C. Then I'm going to do Control F and then I'm going to select replace. And it's going to say find what I'm going to do Control V to paste in that part. And in the replace with field, I don't want to enter anything. So I'm going to click replace all. And as you see, it deleted all of the file paths. So I'm going to click close, double click here. And you can just select all of these files and paste it into an email or a Word document or just save this Excel document and send it to the person who's asking for all the file names in your folder. Sometimes in Excel, when you enter a dash and then some text, it thinks that you're entering a formula and it won't format the cell properly. What you have to do is enter an apostrophe before the data. So you can see that they added an equal sign here. So I'm going to select that. And on my keyboard, I'm just going to enter an apostrophe and click enter. And you see it recognized the dash and the December. Another helpful option is the hide option. So you can hide a certain row or column. To do that, you just select the column that you want to hide. And then over the top letter of the column, you right click, scroll down to hide, and you'll see that column disappears. To get it to show again, you just come over here, right click, unhide, and it shows again. And you can do the same thing with multiple rows. So I'm left clicking, dragging down, right clicking over here, selecting hide, and you see rows 17 to 24 disappeared. If you have a cell that shows a lot of pound signs and you want to show all of the data, all you have to do is double left click in the line between the two columns and it'll expand it to show all of the data. If you want to move or copy a spreadsheet, all you have to do is right click on the tab below and you choose move or copy. So if you want to create a copy of this exact spreadsheet, you select create a copy and here you can decide where you want it in the file or you can select new book and it'll create a new file. So I'm going to click here and you see it created a new sheet with a number two behind it. If you have multiple sheets that are similar, it's helpful to group them all together and do formatting all at once so you don't have to go one by one. So here you can see I have the left sheet selected. So I'm going to come over here, hold down my shift key on the keyboard and left click once and you'll see it's selected and group them all together. Say the first thing I want to format on every sheet is this title. So I'm going to left click and drag over here, merge and center. So you see when I go to these other sheets, it merged and centered it on every sheet. Say next, I want to create a border on all of these sheets. So I'm going to have to group them again. I'm going to select here, come up to border, all borders, and you see it added a border here and it did it on every sheet. But you have to remember to right click and ungroup the sheets before you enter any data because say that I have them all grouped together and on this sheet I enter some kind of word. That word shows up on every sheet. So if you have data on the third sheet that has a word other than dollar, it's going to replace that other word with dollar and it's going to mess up all of your data. Next I'm going to talk about Microsoft Word. I'm going to talk about watermarks inserting signatures, changing case, and removing red squiggly lines under words. So to add a watermark to a document, you go to the page layout tab. Here's under page background, it says watermark. So you can choose confidential, draft, or you can click down here as custom watermark. Click text watermark. This one has ASAP written, but you can do something else apply and you can see it goes back here. You can also change it to be horizontal. Just click horizontal and apply and it changes it. And you can unclick semi-transparent to make it a little bit darker. In this section I'm going to talk about how to insert a signature into a document. So I wrote Frank Sinatra on a blank piece of paper and I scanned it. And now I want to crop it so it's as close to the edges of the signature as possible. And then I save it as a JPEG to whatever folder I want. So you want to place your cursor as close as possible to where the signature is going to end up. Come up to insert picture. You have to browse to wherever you save the picture and just click insert. And you can see that it's not totally lined up with the signature line. So I'm going to click it, right click, go to text wrapping, select behind text, and it's still not behind it. So what I have to do is I put the cursor on top of the image until I see these four arrows. So I'm going to left click and hold and drag it on top of the line. 
so it looks a little bit more realistic. Sometimes you'll get a Word or PDF document that is secure and won't allow you to edit it at all. So I came up with a way to insert signatures on secure documents. So you'll see here, I created a new document and I inserted the Frank Sinatra signature. Basically, I print out the signature on a clear address label and you have to buy Avery 5660 clear address labels before you can do this. So I'm gonna select the signature, go to the mailings tab and select labels. As you can see, I went into options before and I found the Avery US letter and I selected 5660 and I'm gonna click okay. So I wanna click new document. And as you can see, it formatted all the signatures onto the label. So what I do is I print out one sheet of this and I can use it for however many labels there are for future documents. So if I have a secure Word or PDF document that I cannot add the signature to, I print out the document and then I peel off one of these labels that I printed and I just put it down on top of the printed document so that it looks like Frank Sinatra signed it and then I scanned it and it looks okay. This obviously only works for documents where the recipient allows only an electronic copy and not an original. If you somehow get a document that has text that is either in all uppercase or all lowercase and you want to change the case without having to retype everything, all you have to do is select the text. So here I'm just going to left click to the left of this to select it all. Come up here to this icon under font which says change case. So I'm going to scroll and you can see it has five different options. So I'm going to change it to sentence case. So you can see it just capitalized the first letter of the first word. You can do it to all lowercase. You can do it to all uppercase. Capitalize each word. Or do toggle case, which hopefully nobody uses that. <laughs> this thing up here is called the ribbon. And if you're working in Word and you see that it disappears somehow, and it looks like this, and you're like, where are all my options? You just come up here into this blank space, you right click, and you see that somehow the minimize the ribbon got selected. So you just click it once and your ribbon shows up again. If you notice in Word or Outlook, sometimes there are red squiggly lines under a word. It means that it's not in the dictionary for Microsoft. So everybody is talking about Covfefe. So we really don't want to add this to the dictionary, but apparently somebody's got to do it. So to stop seeing these red lines, you just right click the word and click add to dictionary. So if you have an interesting last name or a word that you use a lot that has these red squiggly lines, all you have to do is right click and add to the dictionary and you'll no longer see the lines.